Welcome everyone. I am Adeshawa Josh and this is Africa Matters. Russia's attack on Ukraine is now in its third week. We speak to Africans caught in the crossfire and assess the impact of the conflict on the African continent. And then we'll go to Zimbabwe where authorities have launched virtual court hearings to help contain the spread of COVID-19 and speed up the wheels of justice. And in Ghana, many youngsters are jumping on the skateboarding bandwagon with hopes of one day competing at the Olympics. Tens of thousands of Africans are among the more than two million civilians fleeing Russia's military assault on Ukraine as the conflict enters a third week. Most of them are medical and engineering students who were studying in Ukraine when the war broke out. The EU says more than 10,000 Africans have crossed into neighboring countries in Europe as African governments continue to evacuate their nationals and ensure their safe return home. Ukraine was home to more than 76,000 foreign students, according to government data. Nearly a quarter of them were from Africa, with a majority from Nigeria, Morocco and Egypt. Some of the students are taking refuge in neighboring countries like Poland, Romania and Slovakia, and others are returning home. Meanwhile, some say they experienced racial discrimination at borders and checkpoints as they tried to flee the bombings. Crossing the foreign border to Poland was devastating because, because of the discrimination along the way. Uh, the first discrimination was uh, to keep, keep train station. Uh, they were allowing, they said, only women and children. I said, okay, that's fine. But I don't see you taking the other African women and the other Middle Eastern women that are pregnant. And they were actually in the cold, some with their kids. They all, they all made me realize that if there are human beings, there are others that are regarded different from others. And mm -hmm. I want other Africans to learn to speak up. That's all. Most Africans fleeing the fighting are heading towards western borders, but nearly a dozen Tanzanian students from the Sumi State University in Ukraine found their way to the nearest Russian border and found refuge at the Kursk State Medical University while awaiting for assistance from their embassy. The journey was tough because it involved, it involved both uh, going by car and on foot. Yes. So we we started our journey uh, by a car from a hostel in Sumi to somewhere where we dropped you off. Then we started walking. Then he, in the middle of the journey, we 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 took another car to somewhere we, uh, the last car that we travelled with, and he. We started again walking up to border to the border. Russia's assault on Ukraine may seem like half a world away, but analysts say it's already affecting political alliances, security, food and fuel prices on the African continent. On Wednesday, Senegal's president, Macky Sall, who is the head of the African Union, spoke to Russian President Vladimir Putin, pushing for a lasting ceasefire in Ukraine and for more talks to end the conflict. Let's take a closer look at how the conflict is affecting African countries. About 51% of the African countries condemned Russia's assault on Ukraine during a UN General Assembly's resolution. Nearly a third of them refrained from taking sides, including South Africa, Mali and Sudan. And Eritrea was the only African country that voted in favor of Russia. Egypt faces a wheat shortage as Africa's biggest importer of wheat from Russia and Ukraine. Tunisia and Sudan also face similar challenges in a region where rising food prices sparked an uprising barely a decade ago. Analysts believe military government in countries like the Central African Republic and Mali, which reportedly rely on Russian mercenaries for the protection for senior officials, could face a security vacuum due to a redeployment of fighters. Ukraine has also recalled its helicopters and peacekeeping staff serving in UN missions in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And African countries exporting crude oil and supplying commodities 
are likely to see their revenue surge as prices rise in the global market. But the boom will also come at a cost to oil importing countries like South Africa, which is currently experiencing a record high fuel price hike. Let's hear more from David Kiwua, Associate Professor in International Studies, University of Nottingham Ningbo Campus. He joins me from Ningbo, China. Thank you so much for making our time to speak to Africa Matters. My first question is, what is your assessment of the African response so far to Russia's military assault on Ukraine? Uh, thank you for having me once again. Um, now, of course, this conflict itself has, uh, has uh, you know, created a lot of rancor around the world, more so in Africa itself. And I think uh, you pointed out rightly that uh, a lot of countries in Africa have been uh, pretty unhappy about the conflict, specifically the Russian invasion. Oh, they, they do not necessarily call it uh, a special operations, but they look at it at what's, what it is, and that is the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that has manifested itself, of course, in the UN Security, uh, in the UN uh, General Assembly, where a lot of countries have condemned this invention. But on the other hand, you still have a lot of countries in Africa that are hedging, are uh, a that are trying to be neutral, and perhaps only one country, what you would call a deviant country, uh, so to speak, in international relations, and that is Eritrea, that supports the uh, the, the move by Russia. So. You may say it is a pic it's what you would call a, a mixed picture, but by and large, I think we should say uh, that Africa seems to uh, to condemn the, uh, the 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 invasion of Russia into Ukraine itself. Right. So the African Union chairperson, Senegalese President Macky spoke to Russian President Vladimir Putin on Wednesday. Is Africa in a unique position to influence this conflict? If so, how? Uh, that's a very interesting question about the kind of weight that Africa may bring to uh, to the resolution of this conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, my answer very simply is Africa has very little leverage uh, in 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 leaning on uh, on 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 particularly Russia to bring this conflict to an end. A because while they may have a little bit of what you call general support for 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 Russia in particular. Uh, they do not seem to have a strong economic, even political leverage to try and, and, and influence the proceedings. So there may be a moral sounding board for the continent. Uh, the South African president has, you know, ex um, pointed out that he's pretty unhappy about how things have gone. Uh, other countries have sounded uh, unhappy about things, but not very many countries apart from a few, particularly Kenya, that have had much more stronger words to condemn the invasion. So therefore, we can't say on the whole, specifically within the African Union, that they have little sway, very little sway, to bring to the table to influence the resolution of the conflict itself, beyond being a moral sounding board for the, uh, for the conflict. What are the pros and cons of this war on Africa's economy? And how can the oil and wheat exporting countries in Africa benefit from the ban, or shall I say, the boycott of Russia's oil and products? Um, a good question, uh, perhaps we could start off from thinking, they may not necessarily be, um, well, let's say the, 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 they said there is, on every dark cloud, there is a silver lining. Mm -hmm. So. For well, the fact that uh, the, uh, Europe and, and America are boycotting are part of the energy or the energy resources of Russia opens up an opportunity to a couple of countries like Nigeria uh, and, and Sudan and, and a few others like Libya who are oil producing to try and have perhaps even renegotiate uh, contracts, push up or bump up their production in order to, uh, to fill the gap that perhaps Russia will be relinquishing. So on that way, there is an opportunity for these particular um, oil countries to benefit from this. But beyond that, there is nothing very much uh, for the broader continent to benefit, but rather to lose from. A, on one hand, for instance, as you pointed out, uh, South Africa exports a significant amount of fruit uh, to, uh, to, to Russia. And because of the sanctions, it may not be able to do so. Kenya is one of the biggest suppliers of tea to Russia. This industry is going to be impacted upon. As you pointed out, bread prices have already gone up. Sudan itself had a, an uprising 
all particularly because of the prices of food. Now, wheat being one of the biggest exporters, e exports from Ukraine and Russia has been impacted upon, which means that the price of bread is going to go up. And this is some of the staple food for countries like Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, to mention but a few. So there is a lot to lose. David Kibua, Associate Professor in International Studies, University of Nottingham, Ningbo Campus, China. Thank you so much for speaking to Africa Matters. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We have more stories coming up for you here on Africa Matters, including... I'm Columbus Mavunga in Harare, and I'll tell you why people here in Zimbabwe are optimistic that rules of justice will now be turning faster, thanks to virtual courts. I'm Isaac Kanleji. I will tell you how young people in Ghana are falling in love with the sport of skateboarding. We go to Zimbabwe now, where virtual courts were recently launched to help ease prison congestion. Coronavirus lockdowns have meant reduced hours at courthouses, leading to a backlog of cases. Columbus Mavunga reports from Harare, where the pandemic isn't the only barrier to justice for defendants. Paul Gomo has been in Harare Raymond prison since his arrest in December last year. Delays in the courts mean he hasn't been able to apply for bail until now. He doesn't have a lawyer and he's speaking through an interpreter. This time he has no luck, meaning he will have to try with a higher court. The court in this ruling dismissed your application. So the only request which is left for you is to approach the superior court, which is high court, to not an appeal against the judgment of this court. In Zimbabwe, many criminal suspects spend weeks, months or even years in jail before their cases are heard. Going to court can be delayed by shortages of fuel, breakdown of vehicles, among other logistical problems. 29-year-old Makuburura Rizivishe is an opposition activist. In my 10 months, 22 days in prison, uh, unjustifiable, we're unjustifiable and can never be justified because I committed no crime. He is facing charges of breaking the COVID-19 regulations by attending a protest during the lockdown. He says the delay to his bail hearing is political as he had been arrested for protesting against the government's failure to provide grants to those affected by the lockdowns. But authorities blame limited court operating hours due to the pandemic. Police officers, uh, whether COVID is there or not, if you commit an offense, they will arrest. And then they will be forced to hand over some of those people to the prisons and correctional service. And, and now courts are not seeing, sitting. There is now pressure within the prisons. The visual court system, partly funded by the UN Development Programme in Zimbabwe, is now helping suspects apply for bail, trial debt, or appeal while they are in jail without actually going to court. With the program expanding throughout Zimbabwe in the coming months, these in-person courts are expected to become less and less congested, and hopefully wheels of justice will turn faster. Columbus Mavunga, Africa Matters, Harare, Zimbabwe. Skateboarding became an official Olympic event at last summer's Tokyo Games. Other competitions like the X Games have made the sport a widely watched and potentially highly paid profession. For young skaters in Ghana, that's inspired them to pick up a board of their own and dream big. Isaac Kaleji has more from Accra. These three kids are from different families, but they are bound by a love for skateboarding. They are headed for their weekly practice session with 35-year-old Joshua Odamton. He provides regular lessons for kids in Accra at one of only two skate parks in the entire country. Most of the things I know concerning skateboarding, this is like where it all started from. So I would say this is the ground zero for skateboarding and competitive skateboarding here in Ghana. Joshua started skateboarding at the age of 13 in this neighborhood. He's since become one of the leading faces of the sport in Ghana. He founded Skate Nation Ghana in 2008 to encourage young people to give it a spin. 
More than 50 kids have signed up with the hope of developing a new passion and maybe even becoming pros one day. The dream for me is to push as many kids as I can into skateboarding and not only kids, people as well like Ghanaians because we need to represent what is right because skateboarding has shaped me physically, spiritually and emotionally and it's also brought me closer to people I never thought of meeting. Ten-year-old Brian Odamtin is Joshua's nephew and he started skating two years ago and quickly fell in love with it. Skateboarding is, is my life. It's really fun. If you're skating, you feel happy. Even when you fall, you still get up. Skateboarding is fun. This area has become a safe haven for many kids as they channel their energies into the sport of skateboarding. But there is a bigger goal of training them into professionals who can represent their country in future competitions. Joshua wants to set up a national skate team in the future, but making the sport affordable and accessible for everyone is a challenge. In addition to cost, another problem is convincing parents to allow their kids to take up the sometimes dangerous sport. But Brian's parents say they see some potential. When you see that your child is willing to skate, you should allow your child to go and skate. Maybe your child will do well. Maybe that's the future your child wants. This new Freedom Skate Park has now opened in the center of the capital, offering more people a chance to explore skateboarding and grow. And just maybe, these kids could become the future of the sport for Ghana. Isaac Kalaji, Africa Martes, Accra, Ghana. You're watching Africa Matters, and here's a roundup of other stories making news across the continent. The World Bank says South Africa is the most unequal country in the world, according to their latest report published on Wednesday. It reveals that only 10% of the population owns more than 80% of the wealth, nearly two decades since the end of apartheid. Race still plays the biggest role in reinforcing inequality as the lack of access to jobs and education slows progress towards equitable income distribution. Neighboring countries like Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho and Namibia are also struggling to bridge the wealth gap. The world's second largest diamond producer, Botswana, is looking to expand as the industry leader, Russia, faces global sanctions. The government wants to become a global hub with plans to host a permanent new headquarters for the Kimberley Process, a multinational initiative aimed at eliminating the illicit trade of gems. Botswana's president, Mokwesi Masisi, says revenue from the diamond industry could be used to fund schools, roads and healthcare in the country. In Kenya, the first batch of rare mountain bongos has been released into a sanctuary below Mount Kenya. Conservationists are trying to save the antelope species from extinction. They are listed as critically endangered, with less than 100 estimated to still be alive. Kenya is the last place where these forest antelopes are still found in their natural habitat. The plan is to release five more bongos every six months to diversify the mating pool and strengthen numbers. We go to Kenya now, where more than 10 million students attend primary school. But some of them have to drop out or repeat grades since they can't afford to pay tuition and they often have to work to help support their families. But a non-Nigerian is still hoping to fulfill her dream of becoming a doctor while inspiring her fellow far younger classmates. Taibe Haidin has more. In this classroom in Kenya's Rift Valley, pupils are hard at work studying for their exams. But among the children is 99-year-old Priscilla Sitiene. She's almost nine decades older than her classmates. When I mentioned to my children that I was going back to school, none of them opposed the idea. 
Their only worry was how I was going to be able to read the text on my books. Then I told them that I was going to be diligent and learn how to write, step by step under the teacher's guidance. Sitiene is one of the world's oldest primary school students. She says as a child, she never had a chance to go to school. But when her great-granddaughter dropped out of school after getting pregnant and refused to go back to school, she took her place. Now she's a sixth grader with big career plans. I would like to become a doctor because I used to be a midwife. In 2003, the Kenyan government introduced a free primary education in public schools. This gave some older people a chance to get the education they missed out on. Some of Sitiene's classmates are her great-grandchildren. But all students call her Gogo, which means grandma in her native Kalenjin language. When I go outside, the class will remain silent when I am not there. Gogo is doing that and telling them, let us read, let us read. So I find it was uh, something which is actually motivative to me and the pupils. And her classmates motivate her outside the classroom. I'm happy when I interact with the children because it keeps me fit. I get to jump around even though not as much as they do. But I at least move my body. That is my joy. Sitiene says she hopes her commitment to learning will inspire future generations to pursue their education without worrying what others think. Taiba Aiden, Africa Matters. It's never too late to follow your dreams. Now let's take you to Burkina Faso, where there are about 1.4 million blind people, according to government figures from 2015. Handicap International estimates that three out of four of them are un unemployed, partly because parents of children with a disability often find it difficult to invest in their education. But one blind man has bitten the odds in building his career. Mark Klushner has the story. Abdullahi Pandego is a prominent sports journalist in Burkina Faso. He's a football commentator on the state broadcaster RTB, despite suddenly losing his sight as a teenager. It started with headaches, and on January 1, 2007, around 4 p.m., while I was playing football with my friends, I started feeling pain in my head. After five days, my head was swollen. When it returned to normal, I couldn't see. I was blind. So according to the doctors, it was nerves that were affected. We tried to do with what we could, but alas, I stayed blind. Abdullahi always wanted to be a professional footballer, but when that dream came to an end, he turned it around into something just as fulfilling. I wanted to be a footballer. I couldn't do it on the field, but I'm still a sportsman by giving information and analyzing the different matches for our listeners and viewers. He says he struggled to accept his condition at first, but then decided to focus less on his limitations and more on his abilities. It is through various narration and comments of journalists who detail the matches at length, especially on the radio, that I draw my conclusions. And as I have played a bit of football, and I know some of the basics of football and everyone's favorite position, I take these results, especially the statistics, compare them with previous statistics, and draw my conclusion. His comments are highly praised for being objective, and he now has amassed quite a following. Just recently, he was on the national television deciphering a match. A friend called to ask me if he was able to see or not. I told him that he can't see a thing, but it's a sixth sense that is very developed in him. Abdullahi says he wants to see more disabled people find a career they love. He hopes his work will inspire them to go after their dreams. Mark Luzner, Africa Matters. And this week, we explore Grand Bazam, a resort town in southeastern Ivory Coast. It was the country's first capital, but today, palm trees stretch along the Atlantic coast and bring the soothing sounds of the ocean waves. Let's take a closer look.
That's our show this week. Please share your thoughts and suggestions about the stories you've seen on this episode or ideas on what you would like us to cover on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Matters. Feel free to reach out to me on my personal handle at Adeshewa Josh. You can watch this episode and more on YouTube. Just search Africa Matters. Like, comment, and share. We'll leave you with these images from across the continent. <laughs> <laughs>